People that are in this business, they'll lead you astray. This is not what God intended for you to do with your life. My mother got sick. What happened to her? Your daughter. I don't remember giving birth to you. Ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about this sure. movie. <laughs> when I remember watching this when it came out, I was like, Lori Collier made Cherry Baby. That's a huge deal. Female filmmakers, my bread and butter. Remember when the ads came out, and I was like, how is this a Lifetime movie? This should be like a $100 million production. That's sweet. Thank you. The generic question to start with. Do you recall the first Marilyn Monroe movie or the first time you saw her in popular culture? Well, here's the thing that I'll say about me and Marilyn Monroe and my childhood and my teenage years and all that. I always had the impression that Marilyn Monroe was this dumb, blonde, bombshell icon for horny frat boys and their dads. And I was always more identified with the counterculture from a very young age. I stopped shaving my legs and my armpits and was kind of a hippie, I guess. Went to a lot of Grateful Dead shows. So I think I saw the requisite, like either some like it hot or how to marry a millionaire first. And I was not impressed or unimpressed either way. It just did, it seemed like outside of my realm of culture that excited me or interested me certainly wasn't the image of a woman that I was striving to become. I just don't have that look. So it never appealed to me as like someone who would be a role model or iconic for me. I was more interested in Patti Smith. She was a role model. Also an icon in her own right. Yeah. So that said, I think I was in college or living in San Francisco post-college when I saw The Misfit. And at that point, I was like, oh, she's really interesting. She's really sad and broken and dimensional. She's more than just that image that's been commercialized. So I didn't learn a ton about her early life at that point, but I definitely developed a respect for her as an actress and also as a public figure. And I did understand that she had issues with addiction, that she committed suicide, that there was definitely like an edgy, super edgy side to Marilyn Monroe more than I was aware of when I was much younger. So I just held on to that. I was like, oh, I respect this woman. She's really fucked over by the patriarchy. Poor thing. You know, she died when she was only 36 years old. Yeah. And then it was when I was pitching on the job for Lifetime that I decided to do a deep dive into research on her. I learned all about her early life. Some of the things she did when she was famous that you could categorize as sort of activisty, like she broke the color bar at, I forget the name of the Los Angeles club. I want to say Copacabana. I think it's the, Ma- the Macombo. Yes, yes, Club Macombo. Yes, when she said, you put Ella Fitzgerald on the schedule and I'll sit in the front row every night. And Ella Fitzgerald was the first black musician to perform right. there as a result. Unfortunately, that never made it into our mini series, but... I learned all this stuff about her early life. She was born into the charity ward of the Los Angeles General Hospital. Her mother was schizophrenic. Obviously, that's all in the miniseries. And then I was like, oh, I see how I can find my way through telling this story because she does share a lot of background with characters that I've represented, like New York and Dream, Sherry Baby, obviously. I developed a pitch base from there, and then I got the job. The rest is not history. <laughs> but I am really proud of Kelly's performance. I think yeah. instead of like imitating Marilyn, she really cha- channeled Marilyn. And toward the end of our shoot, well, no, actually, it was on the last day. She said to me, oh, I can feel her leaving. 
she's leaving me. Wow. A very specific and intense process. She had an acting coach wow. with her all day long. They would go back. She had so many lines. It was a 250-page script. She would go back to her room after we wrapped, run lines for the next day with her acting coach. I mean, it was a very intense process. She really brought her A game, and she deserves to be respected for that. Totally agree. You were preaching to the choir. You've seen a lot of Maryland movies. Oh, I've seen them all. You know. The biopics, the ones that have been made about her life, the many oh, of them. Some. You don't ever need to see it, but do not watch it. It's terrible. Goodbye, Norma Jean is like this. I... It's made in like the 70s. Netflix has it. I don't know why they have a DVD copy of it, but it's like Misty Rowe, who was on Hee Haw, plays Marilyn, and it's just a 90-minute movie about how she meets people and literally is raped by every single person that she meets and then becomes well, famous. Do this is salaciousness. I yeah. have to... I have new rules about stories that I'm going to tell about mm-hmm. women, and one of them is that I'm not going to, because I get these scripts every once in a while, I'm not, I'm not interested in telling a story of a woman where we just watch her get treated like shit for 90 minutes or two hours, or no, I've never seen The Handmaid's Tale, it's too close to home, I'm not interested. That doesn't strike me as entertaining or even something that I'll, I'll learn from. You know, because I find that when I learn from a movie or a TV show, that's its own kind of entertainment. Mm-hmm. So I don't really mean like entertainment for laugh's sake. But if there's work that comes to me that's just about a woman being raped over and over again or stuck in a mental hospital for her entire life, you know what I mean? Like, I just, yeah. like, you know, or basement hostage story, you know, that's another one I room. I've read about the basement hostage phenomenon enough to know, like, I don't really want to watch that. Just because it's very close to the bone. And I do think that unfortunately, when the representation of Marilyn Monroe's life, focus has been on the negative. It has, yeah. And she was the first woman in Hollywood to have her own production company, Mm -hmm. period. So let's take a look at that. And again, back to the Ella Fitzgerald moment. There are plenty of really heroic strong things that she did and that she stood for that we don't necessarily know about in our common culture of Maryland, but it exists. And so it's really just what spin do you want to put on the story? And for some reason, I I don't know, it's like people really like to watch her get treated like shit. It makes me... I don't like to uh, genderize, but so many of these movies, especially the more Hollywood you get with Marilyn Monroe, are directed by men. What stands out so much about your interpretation is that you're one of the few female directors that's actually looked at her life. For me, at least, that says a lot of how men perceive her in cinema as like the other one with Mira Sorvino and Ashley Judd that people really like. Oh, Norma yeah, Gina Marilyn. Also very sexually fueled. It's all about she meets a guy and there's a sex scene and other things happen, but I remember it just having a lot of sex in it. And I was sitting there thinking like, okay, really? I'm wondering if it might just be how she was sold to men as this sex object and that just that hasn't gone away yet. And it's very well, frustrating. She was, she was uh bombshell. You know? Right. She was selling her sexuality all the way through, for sure. I was a mentor at the Athena uh, Screenwriters Lab this Mm -hmm. winter, and there was a woman who had a script about sex trafficking, and it was a superhero story. It was a fantasy, and the superhero was a woman, and she was going to liberate all these girls. We had a lot of conversations about how you represent the trafficking scene. Mm -hmm. So it's really just a matter of shots you use, action that you direct your actors to take, point of view, camera angles. I don't think you shouldn't tell the story. It's just how do you tell the story? Right. Like all the other actresses of her generation, she had to do what she had to do. It's so funny because Time's Up happened, me mm-hmm. too, right? And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And of course, oh, my God, you know, the Harvey Weinstein story is horrific. Yep. It's not a surprise, though, but... I just kept thinking, well, what, what, what is, don't we all know about Marilyn Monroe? I mean, like, mm-hmm. this is this was the status quo back then. Yeah. You, know, you had to sleep with the studio boss. You had to sleep with the casting directors. 
on and on and on and on. And a lot of these women, before they got a break, they were prostituting themselves. Some weren't. Some were Christian. There was one who had like seven kids, 18-inch waistline, one of these old movie stars. And I just thought, Jesus, God, like, how does that work? Like, she got all those babies in that waist and then to be a Christian. Sure, there was the odd actress who didn't have to, quote unquote, sleep away to the shop. But that was very common back then because of that, yeah. you know, because the business is so virulently misogynistic. And they had little pharmacy stands on the lots for when a woman would get agitated or sort of like write her prescription and they took them all on drugs too. Yeah. It's a whole other phenomenon. We had seen more of that in, in my show because that's what happened to her. And I think you, it comes across, but it's like, here, honey take this, or this yeah. will help you lose weight or whatever. And that Judy exactly. Garland's another prime example. And all those ones whose names we don't know. Yeah. You know? So, I always talk about Jennifer Jones. I don't know if you know her, know but her. Jennifer Jones, a, a huge star who was married to a guy that she loved, and she caught the eye of David O'Selznick at the studio, who was the executive, and he forced her to get a divorce from her husband and marry him. And then the first husband died, and people blamed her. It said that she killed him. He died of a broken heart. And I'm the one champion for her in classic film Twitter world. It's like, you have to look at the power imbalance there. The fact that this guy was in charge of her career, and if he says, get divorced and marry me, that's what you do. Yeah, it's very interesting to look at old Hollywood today because everything old is new again, and we're seeing all of that play out in the same ways. Yeah, and working with the script. What I love about this movie is that you're focusing on the relationship with the mother, and it's not overly antagonistic. Another Marilyn biopic, Blonde, which is just all about her crazy mom. Working with that story more than anything, and making that kind of the overarching theme. I think that's the best part of the show. It is. And Susan was a blast. I mean, she's a real hoon. We had a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Well, I watched this TED Talk about schizophrenia given by a schizophrenic woman. Like, we did, we did our homework, and Susan had worked. She had volunteered at Bellevue years earlier in a psych ward, so she's been in contact with people with very severe schizophrenia in an institutional context. So she actually had real-life experience to bring to it. I'm not an expert. I did a lot of research at the time, and it felt like I brought something to it for sure. But it, there's six or 700 biographies about yeah, Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, there's so I mean, many. I've talked to a couple of authors, and they that's their big classic film gripe. They're like, if you're not writing a biography about like Marilyn Monroe or Audrey Hepburn, nobody wants to publish your stuff. So funny. I read the Joyce Carol Oates one. I thought that was being in fiction. Which they did turn Otto into a movie. My favorite. Who turned it into a movie? They turned the Joyce Carol Oates version into a movie called Blonde. Lifetime yeah, showed it as well a couple of years ago. I was wondering if that was based on her book. Oh, I didn't know that. I knew Andy yeah. Dominic was trying to get it made for the longest. He had a whole... He was. He had Chastain. He had... He had Naomi <laughs> Watson, Jessica Chastain, and now I, yes. I think it's just canceled. Very sad about it. That book is questionable, I think. Yeah. Absorbing, but... It's got some things in it. There's so much written about Marilyn, and watching your interpretation of it, it was the first time I had ever seen the time she had spent in Payne Whitney, the mental institution. Mm -hmm. What was that like to well, film and intense. execute? Now, whenever you do a scene like that, everybody's just, their antennas are up, and people tend to get, by people I mean the crew, mm -hmm. it tends to get a little more quiet, and you got to give the actor a lot of room. You know, it was hard on her because, like I said, she wasn't faking it. She was living it. So that was really hard on her and sad for her. But, I mean, I thought it was shot beautifully. I worked with Chris Manley. I, I wouldn't have had gorgiosity of shots and lighting on my own, that's for sure. He <laughs> brought a lot to the table, and I learned a lot from him. You know, he'd shot six seasons of Mad Men previous. Wow. So his first job post-Mad Men too. It was fun to hear stories from the trenches of Mad Men. I thought he did a great job in that scene in particular. This is a movie that Lifetime gets such a bum rap. And they've done so many of these biopics. Going back to, they did the Cheryl and Fenn take on the Liz Taylor story from, I think, like a decade or two ago. This one, it looks so opulent. It looks so well put together. I and know, I'm a, and we had a pretty low budget. I was going to say... <laughs> So I thought we did a really good job making the most of our budget for sure. 
I think it was like 13, 12 or 13 million for four hours. Wow. We had to represent four different eras, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, seven wigs. Marilyn alone had 95 <laughs> wardrobe looks, hair, makeup, wardrobe looks, 95. That was just one character. Obviously, our protagonist, the costume department, was also designing for all the extras, all the background. So the kids in the orphanage and what they're wearing. So I thought we made them a lot out of that budget. If you think of HBO, yeah, know, yeah, uh, four part mini series, I think they have four or five, ten times, you know, the amount of money that Lifetime Lifetime produces a lot more of them. Mm-hmm. Lifetime gave you the room to tell the story that you wanted to tell, or was there a desire to no, have we certain things together. included? We work together. Yeah, no, no, if they're a television network, they they want what they want. There's less creative freedom in in that relationship, but. They're extremely experienced and and good at what they do, so I learned a lot from them. I know you mentioned the Macombo story. Were there scenes for you or moments that you wish had budget been unlimited time and unlimited that you really wanted to explore about her life? No, I think it's all there, aside from that one, yeah. I own this movie. I've watched it several times. Oh, thank you so much. That's so cool. It tells such a great, compact story without... The elements that we've seen, somebody who watches so many Marilyn biopics, the Kennedy right. stuff and the pill popping, I was like, I've seen all that. There's a lot of humor, too, in it and heart. It's just nice to see a movie where Marilyn actually has like moments of happiness. I mean, there's moments of struggle, but there's moments of levity. And I don't feel we get that enough in her story. <laughs> I love her and Joe. Her and Joe have some really happy yeah. times, although he was... There were problems there. <laughs> Uh, in the 50s context, maybe. But I love to get recommendations from people, especially with Marilyn, who has such a finite slate of films. But what are the movies that you think best encapsulate her work that you love? Misfits, Some Like It's mm-hmm. Hot. I, I do love hot. Prince and the Showgirl. <laughs> it's very flawed, but she's so beautiful in that movie. And I love the dress. Oh, I'm a nerd, really so. <laughs> she modeled way more than she acted. But not even like officially magazine model, but she just... Is one of the m- most photographed actors in the history of Hollywood. Mm-hmm. There's something like, you know, 70,000 images of Marilyn Monroe. Or maybe 50,000? Yeah, something like It's a high something number. Something like that. The top two are some like it hot and the misfits for me. Have you seen Don't Bother to Knock? Marilyn. Yes. That's a good yes. one, too. She's not in it that much. No, but I think, like, in terms of her playing a villain and trying to do something a little bit different but she just couldn't get it's to great, it's maintain. It's a great role. So psycho. It's fantastic. I forgot exactly. about that. Exactly. Yeah, you get glimpses of like what could have been had she not been shoehorned into what she did well, but it would have been nice to see well, she tried to, She tried to break out of it with studying with Stanislavski and studying in New York with yeah. Lee, yeah, Strasberg and you know Lee Strasberg's estate controls now. He does. Yeah, yeah, I did know that, which I was like, really? I think I learned that about five or six years ago, and I was like, oh, okay, well, that might explain why she slapped on everything. I don't know. <laughs> it's interesting. At least she didn't leave it to her Svengali doctor. There are some true. people who think that he had a role in her death. Yeah, I've heard that theory. I love all the the mainstream ones. Mm-hmm. Gentlemen Prefer Blonde, yeah. Mary Millionaire. I love when she does that Marilyn persona, mm-hmm. you know, and that was something I worked with Kelly on quite a bit. Like, when is she her natural self and when is she Marilyn Monroe? Mm-hmm. Because it's funny. It's comedy. She's not doing it to to be sexy half the time she's doing it as a comedy routine yeah and it's fantastic she's so good at it she's so talented she's obviously a brilliant woman you know it was not, shocking not super educated but the greatest hits of Marilyn there's the, my greatest hits of Marilyn to watch some of her earliest films which are not that great she's not in them a lot but I think I was shocked when I heard her actually speak in her regular voice because I had only seen the breathy yeah, Marilyn. The breathy. Exactly. And then she's got like the voice that's two octaves lower. I was so surprised, which is why another reason I love your interpretation is that you actually get to see her 
putting on and off the voice putting and actually on. talking mm-hmm. like you would assume a normal person would talk, which I was like, yes, somebody notices that that's an act. <laughs> right. Well, it was written into the script. All of her acting lessons with Natasha mm-hmm. is when she started cultivating that voice. The moments I love of hers, I think it's How to Marry a Millionaire, where she has to wear glasses. Yes. Because she's so short-sighted, and but they're not attractive, so she takes them off and bumps into things all the mm-hmm. time. I think that's really funny. She's reading books and upside down. <laughs> yeah, she reads books upside down, yeah. Bus Stop I was not a fan of. Thank you, thank you. I I don't like it. Bus Stop at all, <laughs> yeah. I hate it so much. And I've been told I'm wrong. I'm going to say, well, you know, Lori Collier says that uh, it's not that great. Oh, so. You know what? The first one I saw when I was a kid, I know what it was. The first Marilyn Monroe movie I saw as a kid was The Seven Year Itch. Oh, that's a good one. The good one. I loved it. It's but not again, my favorite. Like I but said, culturally, I wasn't really in a place as a teenager to do a deep dive on Marilyn. It just wasn't the woman that I ever was going to want to become. And I mm-hmm. think when you're a teenager, you, that's what you're looking for. You're like trying to figure out who am I going to be? I did see that one first, the seven year itch for sure. That is a great one. I was able to see sure. gentlemen prefer blondes at the Egyptian this year on nitrate. And it was, oh, fun. it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. I mean, I've seen that movie a million times, but to see it on a big screen with the color and in her face, in love more than I already was. Testament to the power of cinema. (laughs) Yeah. I didn't love There's No Business like show business either. Yeah, it's not really her movie. It's not her movie. and It just felt so dated. I watched it. I was like, I I love Niagara. Niagara's fantastic. Oh my gosh, so great. Uh, That may be one of her. Maybe it's Niagara, so I'm like it hot and this fits. I can see that. That's a me. solid three. That's a very solid three. I would three. say those are my top three. Definitely my top three are Niagara, Some Like It Hot, and The Misfits. Thank you, Kristen. Oh, any time. Thank you being a fan of that show. Oh, I, I any time. Like I'm a fan of I, yours. Well, hopefully I'll get to make another movie soon. I'm working on it. My fingers are crossed. Oh, no. oh you're sweet. Thank you. Thank you.